there was um, a question that someone um, sent me. It had to do with the report of Um Salama. Um, what I was just. Um, Uh, 32, yeah. The report of Um Salama that when reportedly she complains to the Prophet, uh, and uh, uh, well, anyway, that she tells the Prophet, men, why is it that men have all the favors? They get to go to war, they get to be martyred at war, and they also uh, inherit more than we do, and then According to this report, verse 32 is revealed to say, um, don't begrudge one another what Allah has uh, favored you with. And the, the question was, I, I think the, the, um, the person asking the question, in this report, in this report, the idea that men can be martyred at, at war is not seen as a negative. It's actually seen as a positive. So it, the, the, the way the report is constructed is they have the opportunity to become martyrs far more than we do. So it's like they get a bigger share in this world and they also have the opportunity to have a bigger share in the hereafter. That's the logic of the report. But as I said, I think it was last halakha, as I said, that I have very, I'm very skeptical about the authenticity of this report. I'm very skeptical that um, that it, as an occasion for revelation for reasons that I explained in the, um, um, for reasons that I explained in the last halakha. But it is not unusual to, I mean, the report has this store, sort of, and, and this is something that we see quite often in the tradition has this sort of stealth character to it. It appears to be, let's use the language of the age, it appears to be a feminist report. It, it starts out sounding like Um Salama is speaking up for the rights of women. It, it at first glance, because she's saying, how come men get all the favors. They get to go to war, they get martyred, and they have twice the share in an inheritance. But there are several, so that's the, at first glance, it appears to be a pro-feminist report. But what is the gist of the report? What is the takeaway of the report? What is the net result of the report? It's actually not a pro-feminist report, it is an anti-feminist report because ultimately um, the response to this is supposedly God responds and, sa and says, um, stay in your place. Don't look at what God has favored men with. And at the risk of repeating myself, just keep in mind that the report itself then is not entirely it, it it it's historically inaccurate at several levels one um it is not true that only men had the opportunity to be martyred because we know that women who wanted to fight in battles were not prevented from do, doing so so at, at the most basic level, the most, the most basic level, well, you know, if you wanted to go out in a ghazwa and to actually fight, well, as some women did, 
and risk getting killed, there, there was nothing preventing you. The Prophet didn't prevent women from doing that. And some women, in fact, did. So, and if women do that and they're killed in battle, they're martyrs as well. So that defies the logic of the report. The second thing is that it is women don't inherit half of what men inherit in all cases. And as I talked about, um, it is only in specific situations. So there, again, the, the report shows a discrepancy with the, the mechanics, the specifics at that level as well. Third, that these reports, there are reports that are always, um, that bear greater levels of scrutiny that must be scrutinized carefully in terms of both ISNAD and in terms of historical analysis. ISNAD analysis is where you take the science of Rijal, what the various books on the transmission of hadith said about the people who transmitted the report. And this person told this person told this person, and you then, you know, various scholars would come to a judgment. This person is trustworthy, this person is not trustworthy, this person is forgetful, and so on. But there is another analysis, and that is the historical analysis where you use tools of, modern tools of historical analysis to see if the report actually makes sense. This is another topic that we, you know, we might be able to talk about, and especially it's relevant if we if we do the Sierra thing. That the science of Rijal, the science of transmission itself, was not ideologically neutral. Who the people of Hadith declared to be reliable as a transmitter or not reliable um, who they who they narrated hadith from who they accepted as a hadith transmitter itself was not ideologically neutral so for instance we notice that among the muhaddithun and this is in Bukhari and Muslim and um, maybe less so in Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah, but definitely in Bukhari, Bukhari and Muslim and at Tirmidhi, is that they tended to favor transmitters who were politically um, pro umayyad or pro-Abbasid, of course pro-Umayyad is, is the most relevant, pro-Abbasid is too late, but for in, in most cases. But that, so for instance, uh, the amount of reports that are, tra are narrated from Al al-Bayt is shockingly low. The amount of reports that are narrated from the companions who took part in the Battle of Badr is surprisingly low. Um, we know that often the narrators of hadith that the state had a problem with, the muhaddithun would often avoid. We often, this is, this is well documented when it comes to political issues, such as who was pro-Umayyad, who supported Muawiyah, who supported Yazid, and who supported Al al-Bayt. But where it is not well documented, 
is where it comes to gender issues. In the same way that the transmission of hadith responded to power dynamics of who was in, in power, in power dynamics of the state, the transmission of hadith also responded to gender power dynamics. So we know that some muhaddithun were particularly um, misogynistic, while others transmitted reports or narrated the traditions that, I mean, it would be ahistorical, ahistorical to call them feminist because the concept didn't exist. But um, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, challenged a lot of the misogynistic assumptions. And so hadiths like the Um Salama narration that comes and tells us that what verse 32 is talking about is telling women to not not think in terms of well, why were men favored over us uh, it has numerous problems when you sit down and analyze who is transmitting, who is narrating this hadith? Who are the individuals that play the star role or the, 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 you know, the, the prominent role in transmitting this hadith to us? And, and because of this analysis, you are quite suspicious that this is in fact the, a tradition that even in fact that this entire incident with Um Salama took place. I mean, it might have been, uh, and there is actually evidence of that, that, well, there's plenty of evidence that women were pushing back in Medina, um, that the presence of the Prophet ﷺ empowered women and that various women were pushing back against Qurayshi uh, practices and traditions. Qurayshi traditions were um, very conservative. Medinian traditions were far less conservative. There is a good reason for that. I mean, I, I don't want to take us too far away, but you're not going to have an opportunity to hear this from, from someone else, so... Um, Quraysh was a, a, a tribe that relied on trade, commerce. And the, the logic of commerce was profit and business deals which was clearly male-dominated, and the wealth of Quraysh made the seclusion of women quite possible. You didn't need women to go and make a living. Men made the money, and men supported women. And women's role, to be very blunt about it, was basically to entertain to be available to men who were the, the business class. I mean, it is very much like in the modern age when you see, you know, businessmen that um, deal with women as entertainment. Quraysh had that, that attitude. They divided women into their women of honor, and women of honor are, are secluded, 
women from honorable families, and women from honorable families are not to be heard or seen, and they're wealthy, and their role is to take care of their husbands and to raise the children, and women of entertainment. And they often thought of women of entertainment as the working women. But these women had no rights. I mean, these are the, the singers, the dancers, the pub workers, the, those who work in, in, in bars and so on. But they, they, they're outside the, the, the consciousness of, of any right to talk about rights or entitlements and so on. Medina was very different because Medina uh, had a far greater level of poverty. And it was the, 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 the traditions in Medina were such that many families um, needed women to work because they needed women to bring in an income. And when the hijra took place and the habits and cultural practices of Mecca were brought into confrontation with the habits and cultural practices of Medina, the Prophet ﷺ himself clearly sided with the mobility that women in Medina enjoyed. So while a lot, while some Qureshis, well, a lot of Qureshis, not some, but, you know, they wanted the Prophet to tell women, imitate the Meccans, do what the Meccans do, seclude women. What happened in practice was that the Prophet ﷺ did exactly the opposite. He supported the mobility of women, supported even women joining in battles, women participating in the bay'a, uh, women participating in um, uh, shura. Uh, he, he would often visit and circulate and speak to women and, and so on and so forth. And there are many, many, many stories about this, including, you know, the, the attempt by Qureshis to get women to stop attending prayer and the Prophet ﷺ saying, no, they, you know, they, you can't do that. But this cultural clash, if you will, um, is then when it comes to imperial Islam, who is it that comes to power and creates the first Islamic empire, it's the Qurayshis. It's not the Ansar, not the people of Medina, but it is Quraysh. And it is not just any Quraysh, but it is not the, Qur not the Banu Hashim, the, the family of the Prophet that, that ultimately comes to power after Ali is assassinated, but it is the aristocracy of the family of Muawiyah. And, and this is Qureshi aristocracy. So Qureshi aristocracy had wanted to roll back the practices that they believed are quite offensive in the Medina period. And among the practices that they are targeting is the mobility of women. So the state itself supported the circulation of hadith, not just hadith about obeying a ruler, even if the ruler is unjust. Or hadiths that tell you that you have to accept injustice because it's God's will. But they also circulated and supported and backed up in a variety of ways 
the circulation of hot, very misogynistic traditions. To push back and tell women, okay, now the Prophet is dead. The time where you had Abu Bakr and especially Abu Bakr and Ali, because Omar and Osman, it was more ambiguous. But Abu Bakr and Ali were both, um, Abu Bakr ruled for a short period, but uh, Ali was, was, was the, the, the product of the uh, school of the Prophet, Ali Sato Salam, is thoroughly. So he was not going to support um, Quraysh attempting to superimpose its cultural practices upon early Islam. And he stood up to that, and he opposed, and he resisted that in a very pronounced and 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 um, uh, distinct way. But when Ali died, and the Qureshi aristocracy came to power in the form of Muawiyah and the people that Muawiyah picked, um, we were back again. To Quraysh saying, and this, by the way, also why the verse, so called the beating verse, we clearly see clear evidence that this was never intended to speak to the discretion of a husband, beat your wife to discipline her, if you will. But yet, the traditions that support that narrative, the traditions that tell us that, oh, after the revelation of this verse, you know, 60 women came to the Prophet and said, our husbands are beating us. It Superficially, the tradition might appear like, oh, well, you know, it's no, it's an anti beating tradition because they're complaining about it. And the Prophet says, well, stop doing that. But in reality, what, what this tradition does is that it subverts the original context of the revelation. And what was the original context of the revelation? It was a legislation to deal with a sexual impro improprieties or accusations of sexual improprieties that took away the dis individual discretion of males. So the, the, actual, the actual original revelation did exactly the opposite. It came and said, it is not up to you to accuse and then to enforce. You have to have a judicial process. We are going to regulate it as a actual judicial process. But that was subverted. And it was subverted precisely for the reasons that I'm describing. Now, for every subversion traditions, every attempt by the state, to subvert something, you will always found, find counter-subversion traditions. Traditions that come in and to say, okay, well, the state is clearly supporting a position. Can I work within the state and mitigate the impact of what the state is doing? And so the traditions about the beating should not be with anything more than a twig and should not cause pain, should not cause humiliation. When you look at who transmitted these traditions, so put it very bluntly to you. When you look at who transmitted the pro-beating traditions, lo and behold, you find figures like a Zuhari or like the, the who were clearly allied with the Umayyad political project. 
when you look at the people who transmitted the traditions that say, well, the beating should not be more than a twig or should not cause pain, should not cause humiliation, you find that they were transmitters that were suspected by the state of pretending to be supporters but actually opponents. And what I believe what's going on, what was going on is that these muhaddithun that were, were mitigating what the state is doing. They, they were not willing to do what some, especially the Alil Bayt did, where they actually speak out against the state and say, this is nonsense. The, the prophet never said this, or this is, corru this is corrupting and suffer the consequences because they did suffer the consequences. Or, you know, this, or as a result, have Bukhari, someone who was Bukhari was, was, was um, uh, uh, clearly pro-state. Bukhari's entire history was pro-state. Um, but someone, and so if they took a position like that, then Bukhari is going to ignore them and declare them not reliable. So they weren't willing to do that. But instead what they would do is that they would come and they would work within the system, tempering the, the impact of what the state was going to end up doing. And that is why taking the science of Ilm al-Rijal, the science of transmission, as is from the classical books without scrutiny and, and sufficient thought is extremely dangerous because you, you are pretending that just because in um, books of Jarh al that, that the, you know, such person was declared reliable, such a person was declared authentic, you know, How can it be that people that would convert in the, after Fatah Mecca, for instance, who were clearly ended up, ended up supporting um, Banu Umayyah when they came to power, would transmit far more hadith than someone like Al-Hassan or Al-Hussein transmit. How can that be? I mean, no one was closer to the Prophet والسلام, than Ali and Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein. But yet, if you look at the number of transmissions, and the, the evidence is, is, is quite clear. So it is not just on issues of despotism and authoritarianism, but on gender relations. And not just gender relations, but on issues that have to do with justice generally. So why is it that although, as we've talked about, in Surah Al-Nisa, it is clearly telling you that those people who lived in your household as dependents should not be left to dry. That they, they should, they, you are morally, ethically obligated to share an inheritance with them. Why is it that that was completely ignored? Well, because people of power at the time relied on uh, help people who worked in their households often these people would raise them from the time they were children all the time till you know they are grown men and women but the idea that you owe these people anything beyond the salary you gave give them or the the whatever allowance you it was truly radical and so it was resisted. 